Good morning. Steve here again, here in southern Illinois. Uh, we have enjoyed a wonderful week of fall. Colors haven't come yet, but uh, the nights have been cool, the days have been warm. It's one of those wonderful times of the year. But I want to go back to a topic that we've dealt with earlier, and that's COVID. COVID has burned through 2020 and just devastated the world, devastated our lives. And yet here we are 10 months into this pandemic, and the experts are still arguing about how it spread. Researchers have come up with some small advances in terms of how to treat COVID. And governments are putting down major bets on vaccines. But I think many of you are like me. I just want it to go away. Figuring out whether we need to wear masks or not, or how to prevent it from spreading, uh, just really doesn't excite me. I just want it to go away. Uh, figuring out how to treat the disease uh, so that f less, uh, less people die or, or require hospitalization, that would be wonderful, but I'd prefer for it to go away. And vaccines, I'm just really not excited about how we're trying to rush a process that often takes decades into months or a year. Um, yeah, there's not much that excites me about COVID. I just want it to, to go away. Now, one of my favorite sci-fi characters is Doctor Who. And there's a character, There, there there's a... Um, a species in the early Doctor Who that shows up repeatedly called the Daleks who uh, you know they they are they're these mobile tanks they live in these mobile tanks their entire lives and uh, they just every time they meet a creature they they start saying exterminate 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 and I find that I'm like that with COVID I just want it to go away I mean we did that with smallpox we're trying to do that with polio. Why can't we do that with COVID? And while we're at it, why don't we exterminate hunger and poverty and slavery and war? Which really brings me up to the question for the day. What do you think God is really trying to accomplish in dealing with sin? Is he trying to rescue us from sin? Essentially, quarantine sin so it's over there and we're over here? Or is he trying to exterminate sin? Do away with it? Now, when I was in medical school, um, I was taught that smallpox had been exterminated, that we'd done away with it. Uh, today we know that that wasn't an accurate statement. Yes, we had done away with smallpox in terms of the human experience. But some enterprising scientists had convinced governments to preserve smallpox in labs. And the only way to preserve a virus is to keep it growing. And so there are labs in the world today where smallpox still exists and periodically all the safety features that they have in those labs break down and somebody gets smallpox. That's the reality of quarantine. Quarantine always breaks down. There's always the possibility of recurrence. Do you think God is trying to quarantine sin or is he trying to exterminate it? Now, for those of you who are spiritual but not religious, this, 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 this sounds really, yeah, this just smacks of religiosity. After all, you know, I use the word God and sin in the same sentence. 
and those are those are code words for those of us who are spiritual but not religious negative code words so let me reframe the question for you and maybe it will help those of us who are more religious also think about this in a new way what do you want to happen to the suffering and injustice in your life and in the lives of those around you do you want to make it go away to exterminate it or you just want to control it to quarantine it as a Christian I pay a lot of attention attention to what the Bible has to say about topics so let me just flip through some cards some vignettes of the Bible and how the Bible deals with this question it shows up very early in the Bible by the third chapter sin has entered them into the world Adam and Eve have eaten of the tree and God has to deal with the question what do I do with sin and you know what he chooses quarantine he sends Adam and Eve outside of the Garden of Eden he says you stay out there despite the fact that he told them if you eat of the tree you're going to die but the reason he sends them out is because out there they will die eventually and the next chapter Cain kills his brother and God is faced with it again what do I do with sin and here once again he chooses quarantine so to speak Cain is afraid that people are going to kill him that his own parents and siblings are going to exterminate him and God says no and he curses the anyone who kills Cain it's a bizarre episode in this the history of God but by chapter 6 the flood narrative starts and God has had enough violence has now spread throughout the entire world not just humans but animals of every type and God says I am sick of this this grieves me I am going to destroy them all well maybe not all of them and he saves Noah and his family fast forward to the Psalms the Psalms are all about dealing with injustice and the things that the, the things that have been done wrong to us the enemies who are against us and the the psalmists almost to a T say exterminate exterminate you would think it was the Daleks talking except that there's a twist in the Psalms now we're no longer going to just destroy our enemies God make them suffer we want them to suffer we want to punish them with suffering for what they have done when we move on to the prophets Isaiah Isaiah has some graphic descriptions of that suffering in, in, in the last chapter of Isaiah he talks about going out and looking on the corpses of of the enemies of his enemies who have been destroyed they they've been burned and the smoke is still rising from them and the smoke will still keep rising forever and they'll never die and the horror of it all is going to be around forever Jesus actually quoted from Isaiah actually quoted that passage in one of his parables and that's not the only time he talked about everlasting fire there were several of his parables talk about well if, for example the parable of the sheep and the goats which is uh, his telling description of the last judgment he uh, God divides people into the sheep and the goats the 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 good and the bad and he sends the goats off depart into the fire which has been prepared for the devil 
But even though Jesus speaks of eternal fires and burning, he also speaks of the wicked being destroyed, of them perishing. So Jesus talks about both the destruction, exterminate, and the quarantine, keeping them apart but suffering. Finally, we get down to Revelation, and chapter 20 of Revelation talks about the end of Satan, the, the judgment and the end of the sin, the sin problem. Fire comes down out of heaven, inundates the earth, and forms a lake of fire. The wicked are thrown into it, Satan is thrown into it, and here's a twist. Death is thrown into it, and hell is thrown into it. And after that, God creates a new heaven and a new earth. So Steve, where are you going? What, what, is, what are you saying? Well, it sounds like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, aren't I? I'm saying exterminate, and I'm saying quarantine, control. Well, I think you're right. You see, the Bible has both themes, and it's spread throughout the Bible. And so where do I land on this? Okay, I've come to a couple conclusions. Number one, the traditional view, the popular view that's put out in the media and in our Halloween hell houses of hell as a place that Satan is in charge of, where he's torturing the wicked forever. That has nothing to do with Scripture. Hell is not Satan's domain, it's his destination. The eternal fires are not something he has control of, they are his end. Which is something maybe we Christians need to think about seriously, okay? Because it's really embedded in our culture. But when you read the Bible, you find out that Satan's not in charge of hell. Never has been, never will be. And if what Revelation says is true, then hell's not even burning right now. The fires of hell haven't been lit yet. The second conclusion I have is that there's no basis for arrogance. When we argue about whether our destination, whether the end of sin is going to be extermination with sin and sinners completely destroyed, or whether we argue for eternal suffering as the end point of sin and sinners, the Bible talks about both themes, and I don't have I don't have any grounds for arrogantly claiming that you are wrong and I am right. We need to come to grips with the fact that the Scripture talks about both themes: the destruction of sin and its punishment. Sin to me uh, starts with a choice, started with a choice, a choice that twisted Adam and Eve's perspective to the point where they became alienated from God. But that choice brought suffering, and that suffering changes us biologically and genetically so that we pass it on to our children. Now, that conclusion, that perception, is a result of reading the Bible, but it also is a result of the scientific research that has been done in the last 30 years that so shows that the adverse experiences that children ex that occur during childhood change them biologically. It changes their brains, it changes their bodies, it changes their, them genetically, 
and those changes can be passed on to their children. So I don't think of sin in a mystical sense anymore. I think of sin as a very real biological process that started with a choice, which explains why we have a hard time escaping it and overcoming it. You can't separate sin from the sinners because they are integrated. But those are my conclusions. That's my perception. Let everyone be convinced in their own mind. But I challenge you, look at the question, look at the evidence, study for yourselves. Don't settle for superficial answers, even from me. Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up and have a good week.